Radiation's Halloween hack is one of the most famous Mother 2 ROM hacks of all time. Made by the 2B creator of Undertale, Tubby Fox got his start in game making during his teen years by modding one of his favourite childhood titles, Earthbound. His mod would be unsettling yet iconic, now serving as an insight into the mind of a young, budding creator. For the uninitiated, the Earthbound Halloween hack was created by Toby in 2008 for Starman.net's Halloween Fun Fest, an Earthbound content competition in which contestants enter themed works to win various prizes. So, what would first place earn you? A $10 gift voucher for the Fan Gamer store. Not the most stellar prize, but the event was revered nonetheless. Toby's entry would win the Labour category, which was thoroughly deserved given how much work had gone into its game. But first, let's rewind for a second. The Halloween hack wasn't the first game Toby made. That title goes to Arn's Winter Quest. Created for the 2006 Holiday Fun Fest, also on Starman.net, Toby himself allegedly described it at the time as just another generic crappy fan game. And I'll be honest, it's not great. You play as Arn Tai Rit, a man living alone in a snowy shack. As you leave home, Ness immediately joins your party. You then journey to find Santa. A dog and an orange soon join your crew, and before long, you're battling rock stars, waffles, cows, even Starmen.net moderators. Most of the game uses recolored and recycled Earthbound assets, although it was innovative in terms of music, with Toby being one of the first few hackers to fiddle around with the sound. The game is also full of bugs, a fact which Toby was very aware of and broke the fourth wall repeatedly to acknowledge. And while Arn's quest has its moments, generally speaking it isn't well balanced and often frustrates. Today it gives players a look into the style of humour that Toby would trial in his later works. Joke enemies, bizarre boss fights, quirky characters and the likes. For his next Earthbound hack, Toby wanted to remake Brandish, a difficult dungeon crawler from 1991. Brandish saw limited success in the West, but proved especially popular in Japan, and was nonetheless a title that Toby thoroughly enjoyed. He started out by remodelling Brandish's protagonist, Varric, a character who bears striking resemblance to Deltarune's Chris when palette swapped. But not long after the beginning of the project, Toby changed creative direction. He had thought about reimagining certain aspects of Earthbound, particularly Andonuts' character, and the original plot of the Halloween hack was largely born from this. Toby would continue to use Varric regardless, and his bounty hunter backstory would become somewhat pertinent later on. So, leaving behind the backstories, let's talk about Toby's story. It's pretty basic. Varric begins his journey in a leafy autumn time Tucson, rather than the default start point of on it. As the only bounty hunter in town, he's tasked with hunting down a monster that recently murdered a young girl. And it's not clear who that girl is, but it's worth noting that Paula is missing from the preschool where she usually resides, much to her father's dismay. The monster apparently lives in the sewers, and it's your job to neutralise the threat before it strikes again. Toby wanted players to underestimate his hack by making the design seem intentionally lazy. This can be seen in the graphics. Varric lacks diagonal sprites for one. The palette swaps on many enemies are very basic too. The goofy NPCs only add to that atmosphere, while the optional journey back to Onnit is comically unfair. It's a recipe for something a bit like Arn's Winter Quest. But after making it far enough through the sewers, the hack gets seriously dark. Water replaced with blood. Zombified enemies, dystopian winters, the land of doom. Your opponents are covered in mud and guts, visibly suffering. The dialogue's no longer light-hearted, the game gets incredibly graphic. Varric's fear is described in great depth, and that same sense of dread is instilled in the player. Only one thing is for sure. The hack doesn't seem so lazy anymore. The lab in Winters remains, and Dr. Andonuts still resides there. You wonder whether he's the one responsible for corrupting the world outside, but in the meantime, he soon realises that you've been sent to kill him. Andonuts essentially identifies himself as the monster you were sent to hunt. He gets into a revitalising device to try and escape, but it's no use. You simply walk up to the machine, stab him, and he dies. Or, you can press the B button. Enter Andonut's Magicant, a 
A strange world full of past inventions, past regrets, awkward dialogues, and not-so-subtle homoerotic repression. Making trips to various corrupted areas found in the original game, it's at this point you realise who the main character of this hack actually is. Each boss is representative of a fort deep inside Andonuts' mind. The conflict stemming from his repressed sexuality, heartache felt over his poor relationship with his family, especially Jeff, the intense guilt he feels when his son doesn't come back from the battle against Gygus, and finally the fight against the grim manifestation of his id before he reaches boiling point. What I did with this guy was incredibly fanficastic, and I really, really doubt that in Itoi's mind he's like this at all, but he's just one of those characters that's boring and not well explained, so I fleshed him out a whole lot. I just think it's a hell of a lot more interesting if, in addition to all his other things, the reason you're fighting the antagonist is because of an inferiority complex he developed. The fight against the id demonstrates one example of a core theme seen throughout the game. Mercy. Andonuts now presented as this broken and garish demon-like monster begs you to leave him alone. I have done nothing to you, he says. Please, leave me be. The music which plays during this battle pays homage to the last boss fight in Final Fantasy Legend 3, in which Sol sacrifices himself to make sure justice is done. Alike to Andonuts' id, Sol does not attack, but juxtaposed to the mythological and selfless Sol, Andonuts has become a guilty monster, and one who fears, rather than embraces death. So what does any of this have to do with Undertale? Well, all of these games test your morality, albeit to varying degrees. In Brandish, the game Toby took initial inspiration from, this feature is somewhat limited, but it's there. At the end of the first game, the player is given the option to take mercy on the antagonist once they escape, affecting the ending the player gets. It's this idea of taking mercy on others that would evolve in Toby's later works. In Halloween Hack, Toby makes consistent reference to Varric being propelled forward by some unknown force, despite the foreseeable horrors. He implies it's the decision of the player to keep Varric moving, and as such the player is ultimately responsible for all the harms they cause along the way. Ultimately, you find Dr. Andonuts deep within the confines of his own id, imprisoned and warped into a grotesque form, fearful of the protagonist, actually driven to tears by you, the player, and your unabashed pursuit of him into his own world. So these harms are optional, insofar as playing the game is optional. With Andonuts in particular, your murder of him appears to be inevitable. You either kill him then, or kill him now. But the secret third option is, quite simply, to stop playing. It's our morbid curiosity that encourages us to continue, even if it means destroying everything in our path to see it through. Earlier on, players are given the opportunity to finish off desperate survivors to replenish their health. They won't fight back, and you can easily flee, but for the sake of your own survival, you're often inclined to kill them. The player, still unable to return, is now faced with one of the few choices they're allowed in the entire game, to kill the survivors running around for food, or let them live. You don't have to, or you can. It's not encouraged by anyone. I personally don't do it. But if a gaming construct really matters, who's to say they aren't going to be killed anyway? And the Remember Me in a later stage of the game is similar, dealing very limited damage, nowhere near enough to seriously harm the player, and then solemnly waving goodbye once killed. Very interestingly, the body part boss in the same area doesn't actually have to be attacked, Fleeing the battle leads to an immediate win, just in the same way Andonuts tries to flee his own repressed and bottled up mind. Meanwhile in Undertale, players face these moral decisions with each fight they engage in. They can either take the pacifist route, or go on a genocide, drastically affecting the ending they get. With the latter game making the most frequent moral decisions, and with much of the plot revolving around it, Undertale has the most developed implementation of this theme but as we can see, it takes clear cues from Toby's past works. The unknown force which propelled Varric now propels Frisk, and our morbid curiosities are desperate to see all of the endings. This, of course, was far from the only thing that carried through Toby's games. This is it, the final boss theme. I pretty much just yelled whatever I felt like into a mic, and then copied it down. It took forever, but it was super kick-ass worth it. Total embodiment of final bossitude. People know the Halloween hack best for that one song which plays during the final boss battle. It would famously be reused in Sans's fight, 
But did you know about the many other places where Megalovania can also be heard? The prefix Megalo comes from a track in the 1994 game Live Alive called Megalomania. This is then mixed in part with the Brandish 2 track Gado Badora. The song's affix, Vania, as in Transylvania, simply references the creepy tone of the track and the hag. While the Megalovania we hear in Undertale is markedly different to the original, it still uses much of the same Earthbound sound font. As do many of the tracks in Undertale, actually. You can hear Earthbound sounds in Amalgam. But perhaps the best example of this is Fallen Down, originating from a collaborative album Toby worked on in 2012. The hack's influence doesn't end with the music. In Andonuts' Magicant, you can talk to a flower with an uncanny backstory claiming to be born of a failed experiment Andonuts undertook, just like the one Alfie's conducted to make Flowey. There's also the original Amalgamate in the Sea of Eden, a literal amalgamation of several different enemies seen throughout the hack. The speech bubble, I'm old, comes from the Starman Senior in Arn's Winter Quest, technically making it an amalgamation across two different hacks. All this of course bears resemblance to the amalgamates in Alfie's True Lab, towards the end of Undertale's pacifist route, and likely served as the inspiration for them. These parallels Alfie's has with Andonuts make you wonder whether he served as some sort of base for her character. Then, however, seeing similarities across other boss fight sequences makes you wonder if aspects of Andonuts influence several other characters too. If you lose to Andonuts, he becomes hysterical and forces you to restart your game, much in the same way that Photoshop Flowey will laugh at the player before forcefully exiting. During the battle, Andonuts undergoes several phases where he dodges nearly all of the player's attacks, akin to the boss fights against Sans. Both final screens are ridiculously difficult, serving as the final test against the resolve of the player's morbid curiosity. Just how desperate are you to see your genocide all the way through? But perhaps the most interesting, albeit a lesser known element that made it into Toby's later works, was an ending removed from the Halloween hack and later rehashed for Undertale. Toby wanted to try and give Andonuts a better ending by using Lost Souls to try and revive Jeff, but he believed that this was way too cheesy and didn't fit in with the rest of the theme. It might sound familiar though, since the revival of Lost Souls was a concept reused twice over in Undertale, both in Photoshop Flowey's fight and against Asriel. Revived Souls forced evil characters to confront their past guilt in an attempt to find peace and put their ill will to rest. Perhaps Andonuts was not deserving of such a resolution. 14 years on, what does Toby think of the hack today? Well, it's no secret that he doesn't think too fondly of it. In a now deleted tweet, he simply said that it was little more than just a bad ROM hack with swears. Aside from that, he's drawn very little attention to it in his adult life. And while I might be in the minority, I do think people are too readily critical of EBHH, Toby himself included, although perhaps that's understandable. We're all embarrassed by the things we did when we were young, but for a 16 year old to make such a captivating and innovative hack, all on his own, it's quite the achievement. Especially when you consider just how incredibly difficult it is to use PK Hack in the first place. Some dismiss the game as overly edgy, while others think it's genuinely problematic, with the dialogue having aged especially poorly. But I don't think that's an entirely fair evaluation of the game. It's a reimagining of a darker world that could have come after Earthbound, a hack totally in line with the disturbing imagery seen at the end of Mother 2. But we must remember it is the characters that speak to us, not necessarily their creator. It's a hack that deals with incredibly complex themes and was made to push boundaries. It might not be for everyone, but without it, the seminal indie RPG which rocked a generation might have never existed. TLDR, press the B button, stupid.